we kind of think of it as, oh, well, you know, my individual change doesn't matter, but maybe I'll inspire other people and then there'll be enough of us. You know, so we're looking at this this idea of you know numbers that it's all again just well how many people do we have to make this change <laughs> in some senses yes this is important like certain logistical things yes but it's not looking at qualitative change it's not looking at the depth of relationship yeah. mm -hmm. and it's also not considering that the change that comes from us changing isn't just inspiring others it's an actual change in our relationships. Like it changes the energy and the intention and the space and the conditions with which we're showing up in the world. Fundamentally, even if nobody else changes, something has changed. This is Unconditioning, discovering the voice within with Whitney and Jenkins. Hello and welcome to the 54th episode of Unconditioning, Discovering the Voice Within, where I bring on guests and we talk about the inner authentic voice and the challenges and the rewards that come from following it. This week, I have with me Laura Hartley. Laura is from Sydney, Australia, and she is an activist and the founder of Public Love Enterprises, a liberatory space and an online school with an intention to empower changemakers, activists, and entrepreneurs to radically reimagine the world, creating the conditions for social healing, collective thriving, and liberation. Unraveling from capitalism, patriarchy, and supremacy culture, her programs focus on transforming self, entrepreneurship, and leadership. I had a really great time diving deep into the societal structures with Laura and breaking down the conditioning that we're all experiencing and also talking about how to be free within them. It seems like a really relevant topic with everything going on in our world. And so here is my conversation with Laura. Enjoy. Let's go. So you have a background that is very rich in guiding people to find their authenticity within society. And I would love to know how you got to this point. And especially like as an activist, um, you have probably had an inner voice that was guiding you um, to follow this. So I was wondering, if you can remember the first time that you realized that you had this voice within you. That is such a beautiful question. I think, you know, going back even to childhood, I'm incredibly lucky that I've always known that I've had an inner voice. I've always known that I've had a sense of agency, a sense of choice, um, a sense of power within myself. And I really credit that probably to the upbringing that I had. I grew up in a spiritual but not religious household okay. and there's a lot of personal development teachings that you know taught me that there is something within you that you can listen to. Now, obviously, as I got older, adolescence, young adulthood, all of those things, you know, you become a product of culture, you become a product of your environment. And so there's lots of things that we know we take on from our parents and our grandparents and our families or our faith groups, but as I became an activist, I started to look at, well, why is the world the way it is? What are the beliefs that have shaped the world? You know, how do we um, dismantle supremacy culture? How do we look at dismantling racism or handling the climate crisis? And to do that, we need to look at the beliefs that shaped them. And to look at the beliefs that shaped them, we're looking at, oh, well, what do I believe? How do I perpetuate this? How do I uphold the system? And I think that was a turning point for me there when I started to really look within and wonder how the beliefs and thoughts that I had about the world was perpetuating the world as it is, you know, or was recreating the world. And that's when I realized that, you know, I have choice, I have agency, I have my own inner voice that guides me, that directs me. But that all voice is sometimes at conflict with, you know, what society says a successful life is or a good life is or what we're supposed to do and so finding that balance has been you know the journey that I've been on for a while yeah you make it sound so easy <laughs> <laughs> I wish it was it, it's easier said than done <laughs> yeah uh, could you tell me more about that balance that you said that you're 
aiming for and how that process is like for you? You know, a lot of my work, I I talk about getting free from culture, Mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that every single aspect of community or culture is bad. You know, we exist in community, we exist in relationship. That's a beautiful thing. We want that. So it's finding that space between how do I want to be with people? What are the rituals I want to participate in? What are the cultural practices and beliefs that make me feel whole because I'm in community? And then what are the bits that are toxic? What are the bits that are telling me that, you know, this isn't right for you? And even though it is. So it's finding that way to follow what is authentically true for you while still being in relationship with your community. That's the balance Mm -hmm. for some people at some times can be challenging. Very fortunate. I have very accepting family um, who's come a long way and you you can be who you want to be, you know, live the life how you want to live it. But not everybody has that. So finding that space of what matters to you and what relationships you want to cultivate and prioritize, whether it's relationship with yourself or relationship with others, is an important space there. Yeah, I think balance was a perfect word for that. (laughs) I think that totally makes sense. And so you're based in Australia. And I am Sydney, Australia. Okay. And so the culture there is very specific compared to maybe the United States or other parts of the world. So yes and no. And that's a that's a really interesting point. Absolutely. Yes. Australia, every country, every state, every community has their own unique culture. And we live in a globalized Western world where there, you know, we're both English speaking countries, both came from a similar history, um, both history of colonization. And so when we're looking at popular culture, even today of movies, music, Mm -hmm. uh, things that we're engaging in, they're very similar. So although there's specific differences and there are some things that are uniquely Australian, there are some things that are uniquely American. In the context of, you know, histories of countries that were once part of the British empire or had some link to Britain, there's a lot of similarities there. Yeah. So I feel like that can like sort of fit in in any place that you're in to find the balance, as we mentioned, with your own self and your surroundings and the boundaries of what you choose to associate with or not. Absolutely. So, you know, understanding the context of where we are, I think, is important. Understanding the nuances of place is important. But I I also want to bring it back to, you know, when we're looking at systems that have made the world as it is today, particularly in countries like yours, like mine, like the UK, you are looking at systems that were born out of colonization and systems that predated it too, systems of patriarchy, systems of capitalism. You know, these systems are the same generally in our countries and the ideologies that follow these systems of domination, of supremacy, um, you know, of, of this desire for infinite growth, which leads, of course, to, you know, this hustle culture and burnout culture, which I'm sure we'll talk about, you know, is something that is spread throughout the world now. Although there are nuances of place, I think there is an increasing loss of unique culture that we're experiencing. You know, we're losing languages at an incredible rate. And that's a loss. You know, we're losing ways of seeing the world, ways of viewing the world in different ways. So that's the the context there that when I'm talking about cultural wayfinding, I'm really talking about the larger structures that inform many of the places that we exist in. Yeah, I was just reading an article today actually about how cursive handwriting is dying out and how not having that is going to disconnect us from our history because we're not gonna be able to read it as it goes out of fashion and fades away. Oh, that's so fascinating. You know, it, and that's probably true. Like, I remember getting my pen license in school when I was like eight <laughs> years old, and like, you had to like do the cursive letters and tie it all together. But, you know, day to day, my handwriting now is terrible because we right. don't use it. Yeah, we're disconnected from that, like, very primal element, I think, very tactile way of like connecting with our body and pen and paper or pencil, I think. Yeah, in a way that forces you to be slow, 
you know, like I, I love, I'm a writer. I love typing. Don't get me wrong. Like, but when I really want to understand what is going on within my mind or within this problem that I'm having, or, you know, what's going on with these emotions, there's nothing like actually handwriting and putting pen to paper and allowing that to come out. So it is sad in a way when we're starting to see these things diminish, you know, when they offer us such valuable tools. Yeah. So you're on a mission then, it feels like, for change in these structures and the way that things are built. And so how do you see things now and where would you like them to go? So I approach my work as a climate activist. I think we live in an incredibly unique time in history. And, you know, the climate crisis is real. And when we look at the effects and the impacts that it will have in the generations to come and within our generation, within our lifetime of food shortages and water shortages and increasing refugee numbers, you know, it goes far beyond the day to day effects of you know, increased temperatures. We're looking at a radically destabilizing world. And I think we can see that with the last few years. And the problem with the climate crisis is, is that it's not just a matter of technology. You know, we're not going to solve the climate crisis by simply switching just to renewables. They're important. They need to happen. But we also need to look at the mindset and the beliefs that have shaped our world to get us to a point like this, to get us to such a point in time that we're willing to kind of self-destruct as a species. So understanding that we can actually bring a lot of the roots of the climate crisis back to capitalism. And then when we're looking at capitalism, we also need to look at the ways that we have internalized a system like that. Mm -hmm. You know, internalized capitalism is really just the equation of our worth with our productivity. So it's that idea that we always need to be doing more, that we always need to be growing, that we feel guilty when we rest, when we have time off. And of course, this equates with like the ideology that a successful economy is one that is always infinitely growing, that it's never going to go back. And this idea, this metric of success, which is just a belief, it's not grounded in any sort of structural reality, mm -hmm. that success means growth. And that means I always need to be growing. And that's when we burn out because we keep pushing ourselves beyond our limit and our planet or our economies always need to be growing, which pushes the world beyond its limits is what we're coming back to. And so that's really what drives my work. You know, I grew up in personal development. I love that world. I love that work. It's so important. And it sometimes misses the realities of the world that we live in today. It misses the realities that not everybody can you know have a bigger car and a bigger house and all of these things that we deem success we need to re-question what success is and then activism similarly sometimes missed this idea of the inner world of what is actually within us that needs to change you know how are we recreating this system every day even when we don't agree with it yeah. so this bridge here between the two worlds is the space that i feel really called to play in yeah. Yeah. It seems like everything is sort of stacked up against the true like nature of how everything works as far as even like seasons, um, as everything doesn't grow all of the time. It needs time to, you know, go through the whole cycle as do we as humans, because we're not machines. Yeah, absolutely. Nothing in nature is a straight line. You know, there is everything exists in seasons and cycles. So whether it is our bodies with our circadian rhythms, with our hormonal cycles, with our sleep, everything is happening in a cycle, our digestion, uh, whether it is the seasons and the way of the world, whether it's the moon and the tides, there is a time for things. But then the way that we kind of work as humans is not really like that at all. We expect ourselves to have endless amounts of energy to call on whenever we would like. And that's kind of that internalized extractivism. You know, we're just always pulling from my motivation and my energy and my attention because it should be there. You know, it's fine. I'll just power through. I'll rest tomorrow. And we see that mimicked in the way that we're working, that we're just supposed to just keep going, keep pushing. We see life as this kind of long, straight, linear line. And it's a really interesting view of time because not all cultures used to see it that way. 
Yeah, you said the word motivated, and it kind of, in this context, made me think of that in a completely different way than I have before, of like we have to motivate ourselves to be a part of something that is not natural to us. Yeah, absolutely. And because that's the thing, like when we're really called to something, when we're following what is absolutely true for us, you know, that motivation is very natural. It's very right. instinctual. And it and it is going to ebb and flow because it's going to ebb and flow with our energy as well. I think they're kind of in direct relation. Mm -hmm. But when we're having to force it, and like, you know, like hype ourselves up and like, yeah, just keep going. It's very artificial. Yeah. Very interesting connection there. <laughs> you work as a coach, like speaking of motivation. Um, and so I'm curious as to what your process as a coach looks like and how you integrate these concepts into your programs. So this really depends on who I'm coaching and what I'm coaching them around. You know, to put this in the context of the work I do helping change makers and wayfinders with burnout, um, you know, we really have a structure of starting first with the body, you know, mm -hmm. because here's the thing, when we are burnt out, when we're so stressed, and for that, most of us living today, that is the case, I think, you know, the rate of burnout right now is just exponential, we're very disconnected from our body, we live very neck up as a culture anyway. And we've missed the signs, we've missed all the red flags that were going off where our body was saying, oh my gosh, we need to like pause for a moment. We need to like break and reassess. This is not right. And we're like, no, no, it's fine. Like, you know, those tight shoulders, that locked jaw, those headaches that we were getting, that low back pain, we just, you know, we, we took a paracetamol, we took a tablet and we kept going. So understanding that and coming back to what do I feel sensation wise in my body? How do I create this reconnection and how do I build a sense of safety? I think is really important as a first step. But then we also start to look at, you know, what are our needs? What are our boundaries that we're not setting? What are the stories that we're telling about why we do what we do? You know, because when we're telling ourselves stories that oh, I have to do this because, you know, to be a good daughter, to be a good mother, to be a good activist, whatever it might be, I need to do X, Y, or Z, then we're probably also going to burn out because we're doing all of these things that we think we're supposed to, but that we don't really want to. And the moment we like fill our lives with all of those shoulds, again, they drain us of energy. They don't offer us anything in return. And then lastly, the last piece of that, starting to look at the culture. And starting to look at the culture that we influence in our family, our communities, our organizations. But that bit comes after we've done the work in ourselves. It comes after we've started to look within, to look at our bodies and to look at what's true for us and to create lives with more authenticity and more honesty. Okay, so, so looking at things from an internal viewpoint rather than focusing on trying to change things in a rapid way externally. Yeah. You know, and there's a place for external change. And especially when a lot of us are working jobs or we're committing to things that we don't want to do, like that needs to happen. But I don't think you can really make the best choices around that until you've had a chance to look within and to go, what is it that I'm actually feeling? What is it that I actually need? You know, what is within me that is still calling me forward that says this, this, I want to do this. You know, that little voice that we tend to ignore and just push away. That's the voice that we need to be listening to. So before we make the external change, there is this element of going within first. Yeah. For people who might not have like grown up in a open minded or a spiritually focused household, do you have any advice on how to connect with this inner voice finding these things? Yeah, I, I think what it comes down to in the first place, um, at least in my experience, is learning to reconnect to the body. Because this voice isn't just about our thoughts. When we are right. listening to our thoughts or our beliefs about whether we should do something, we are so likely to end up doing the thing that's not right for us because those voices are like all conditioned by the people around us, by the culture that we're in that says, if you want to be a good X, Y, or Z, you need to do X. It's not the answer, but our body is different. You know, our body doesn't lie. It really tells the truth. And so when we're able to 
think about whether we want to do something, there is a corresponding reaction in our body. And learning to tune into those really subtle sensations of, does my chest feel open? Do I feel lighter? Do I feel this sense of ease? Do I feel this sense of uh, presence or groundedness? Or do I feel knots in my stomach? Do I feel tension in my throat? You know, do I feel like this heaviness on our shoulders? You know, and our language is like so primed for this. Like we know this, there's things like, you know, there's butterflies in our stomach or you've got the weight of the world on your shoulders. Like, you know, we talk about, you know, the rising heat we get with love. Like there's so many experiences that we talk about using these words without realizing that they're actually physical sensations in our body. So I was very disconnected from my body a lot of my life. You know, it wasn't until my late twenties that I was really like, oh my gosh, my emotions are in my body. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> and so that was actually a real learning point for me, but it was that that helped me differentiate the parts of my voices, my inner voice that was very authentically me, that felt open, that felt true, that felt light. And the things that I thought were me, the things that I thought I was supposed to do, but that felt heavy and felt trapped and felt uh, controlled. And so breaking free of that and, and choosing to follow that, I think is the first step. I think so too. You mentioned the word stuck. And so I was thinking of all the people who feel like they're stuck in their circumstance or in the machine of what they're in. And if you think that this step is enough for them to find a way out of it. I think it's the first step. You know, it's not, it's not the only step, but I, and it's also not the only first step, but it is a <laughs> first step. Yeah. You know, there's this really common expression, like, that's just the way the world is. It's just the way the world works. You know, this real passivity and very defeatist acceptance of the world. You know, and, you hear this a lot when people have dreams that they want to pursue like i want to be an actor or i want to be an entrepreneur or, i want to do this amazing thing like who are you to do that who are you to dream like that who are you to think outside of the confines of the way our lives are and that's you know what i'm encouraging people here to do you know to think outside of the confines and to dream outside of the confines of how you believe life is supposed to be, how you think the world is supposed to be. What if we were to reimagine it completely? You know, the way the world currently is, is because other people imagined it this way. It's not that it's inherently a fact of life, that it's the only way this planet could be. It's one way, it's one vision that people held that benefited certain people and not others, and it was brought forth. And so what would it be if we were to reimagine it again, but this time, from a deeper place, from what's within us, from what really calls us, you know? So when we're able to listen to that body, to our, to our emotions and to notice what feels expansive and then have the courage to follow that because, you know, that little voice is not always gonna tell you the safest thing to do. It's not gonna tell you the most sensible thing to do. It's gonna tell you to dream bigger than most people will tell you is safe. And then you follow that, that's where you start. And that's where we start to reimagine things and remake the world. And you, you mentioned courage along with artists and entrepreneurs who are having big dreams. And especially as an artist or an actor, uh, there is this sort of concept that people romanticize as a starving artist. Oh gosh, they do. Yeah. And so it, it's really interesting how you can either be a starving artist or you can be extremely famous, but the in-between is not seemingly to be attainable. Yeah. And, you know, we glorify the starving artist. We, we love the arts, but we don't actually place much worth in the person who is a starving artist either. You know, mm -hmm. there in Australia, we have a concept called tall poppy syndrome. And there's a few other countries that exist in I think Ireland might be one. I might be wrong there. If anybody Irish is listening to this and I'm wrong, I apologize. Um, but it's a, it's a very Australian phenomenon that we don't like people to be too successful. Um, you know, un unlike, you know, other countries which really are like, yes, like get to the top of your field. That's the dream. 
there's kind of a point here where, you know, we love the underdog. We love you when you're struggling. And then when you actually reach your dreams, we're like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> you know, you're way too disconnected there. Like you're so out of touch. We like to like cut that dream off there. Mm. And so, you know, where does that come from? What feeling of insecurity, what feeling of disillusionment, what feeling of I can't have what I want, we can't be who we want to be. You know, that somebody dared to dream outside the status quo is driving that. You know, and that's the, the interesting space because you know, when we're then looking at our own dreams, or why am I afraid to follow my calling? Well, that makes sense because, you know, culturally it's actually not that good of thing to be successful. You're supposed to strive for it, but not necessarily reach it. Yeah. And the same with this idea of art, you know, that we love artists, we love, especially over the pandemic, how much did we, you know, listen to music, we watched films, we watched TV shows, these incredible things that actually kept us going while we were inside. But no, 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 like, I couldn't do that, you know, that's, that's too much, people won't like what I do, people might judge me. So it's finding this space of the courage to step beyond those fears um some of which are valid some of which you know aren't as real is it's a it's a strange place to be in but it's a beautiful place i think yes um because as people find the courage uh to follow their dreams the onlookers are then forced to look at themselves so it's a mirror to them that they are not living up to their fullest potential and that they're giving up on their own dreams yes absolutely you know and part of us we sell this is like oh well you can inspire others but for all the people that we inspire sometimes there's also people where it's touched a nerve or it's touched a pain point within them that they're not living the lives that they want to lead and they're not ready or willing yet to make those changes and so the reaction there isn't so much inspiration as it becomes criticism mm -hmm. and so it's less based in us personally and more based in their experience of us of, of witnessing us Right. And so then it comes down to as far as making ripples of change, uh, how does that work? Because there's such a duality in the nature of how things are and especially divisiveness that occurs. And so a lot of people talk a lot about, oh, like just change yourself and it'll have a ripple effect. But now I'm just thinking that the ripple effect <laughs> might have a negative effect too, as we we're just talking about. Oh, this is such an interesting question. You know, I think th there's a couple of different spaces here and there's a couple of different things to, to mention. You know, one is when we're looking to make change in the world, we, we kind of think of it as, oh, well, you know, my individual change doesn't matter, but maybe I'll inspire other people and then there'll be enough of us. You know, so we're looking at this idea of you know numbers that it's all again just well how many people do we have to make this mm -hmm. change right in some senses yes this is important like certain logistical things yes but it's not looking at qualitative change it's not looking at the depth of relationship yeah. mm -hmm. and it's also not considering that the change that comes from us changing isn't just inspiring others it's an actual change in our relationships. Like it changes the energy and the intention and the space and the conditions with which we're showing up in the world. Fundamentally, even if nobody else changes, something yeah. has changed. And so understanding that space that is less about influencing others, although that is important and definitely in some spaces so necessary, you know, whether we're looking at you know, anti-racism or we're looking at you know, uh, circular economies and recycling more, these are important things, but fundamentally the conditions within us have changed and that changes the world. Yes. And as we change individually also, that's also often not necessarily a, the most pleasant of experiences because there can be the shadow side that we have to work through. Absolutely. You know, I think, I think that's life though. Yeah. I think whether we, whether we believe it or not, you know, going through life has moments of grief, has moments of pain, has moments of anger. And the question of how we respond to those moments is less about, you know, our shadow side or less about 
you know, things that, you know, had to happen now to challenge us, you know, that idea again, that we're always mm -hmm. pushing, but it's more just a natural consequence of, of living, of facing what is true for us, of looking at the parts that maybe we haven't looked at yet, that are still there, still in our bodies, still asking to be heard. And then once we're able to do that, you know, we're more resourced, we're more he happier, healthier, we have more of a space within us to process those in future. So there is that moment, like when we choose to look within, when we choose to walk our own path, that mm -hmm. there are challenges and it's not as easy anymore because, you know, your old mechanisms of facing them aren't there or of like right. hiding from them really, I should say. But instead there is a new capacity to face them. And that's the beautiful thing. Uh, I agree with that. I think, I think that prevents some people from making those changes is the fear of getting over to the other side. Yeah, you know, and it's a scary thing. You know, I, I struggled a lot with depression and anxiety and huge amounts of rage, like just overwhelming rage. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. But it took a long time as well for me to really go into therapy, for me to sit down, for me to go, mm -hmm. okay, no, I'm willing and ready to look at this and to process this. Because without that, it's it's very difficult to move forward. Yes. And speaking of mental health and depression and anxiety, I feel like a lot of information is starting to come out about how these things are presenting themselves more often because we are trying to fit ourselves within this society that we don't necessarily fit within authentically. And what are your thoughts on that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I think there's a lot of different reasons for this. It's um, It goes beyond just the authenticity aspect, I think. But there's two quotes that come to mind and they both align with each other. You know, there's Krishnamurti's quote of it's no sign of health to be well adjusted to a sick society. Mm. And there's also Richard Raw's quote, which is that it's very hard to heal people in an unhealed culture. Mm. And both of these kind of hold the complexity that it's not just about us. You know, when we're framing depression and anxiety and mental health struggles, we often see them as an individual problem. Mm -hmm. right? burnout is the same. We see it as some, you know, individual weakness in our resiliency that we just weren't mindful enough or weren't grateful enough, or didn't sit down and on the cushion to meditate enough, whatever it might be. But instead, there's actual conditions of our lives as the environment that we're in, as the culture that we're in, which is influencing all of these things. And when we live in a culture that is based on scarcity, that is constantly telling us that we're not enough, that we need to buy something to be better, that we're not thin enough, that we're not pretty enough, that we're not um, active enough, whatever it might be, you're not enough and we need that to sell to you. Mm -hmm. And we also live in a culture that is founded on this idea of time scarcity, that there's not enough time, that we're, you know, we're always running out, we just got to work a bit faster, squeeze a bit more in, you know, 24-7, like this very hustle mentality. Well, then, of course, it makes sense that we end up depressed because, you know, we feel like we're not enough. We have a scarcity of self-worth. Yeah. We don't have time to make anything better because there's never enough time. We just got to stay on the treadmill or we'll fall off. And then we're disconnected from our bodies and we're disconnected from what is true for us. So we're not doing the things that really speak to us or really call us. We're doing X, Y, or Z because that's what an X person should do. And again, yeah. these conditions and, are leading to the rise. Yeah. And, the, and the fear of survival. Yeah. And here's the thing in, you know, in our culture, survival is a very real thing. The reality is if you don't have enough money, you don't have enough family resources, you can end up homeless. You can end up with not enough food. You can end up on that survival line. And that has been the case for centuries. So that is wired into our bodies that, that even if it's not likely for us, even if we have family, even if we have money, resources, whatever, that is a possibility. And so that is a very real fear that keeps us in place. And I actually think in some ways society was designed with that. It's a power tool. It keeps people in power um, and it keeps people from challenging power. Yeah. So there's structural reasons. So to give your activist a platform, is there something 
that you feel like you would love to share that, or information that you feel like you would love people to know? The climate crisis is the number one challenge that we face right now, but it's interconnected with every other challenge that we face. It's not separate. All of the challenges that we face are connected. So wherever we feel called to work is important. You know, if it's in the space of disability rights, if it's in the space of anti-racism work, if it's in the space of, you know, regenerative agriculture or LGBTQ rights, that is the space that you are called to work and that is where you are meant to work. And all of that is part of breaking it free and remaking the world and dismantling the mindset and the beliefs which have led to the world as it is, which has led to the climate crisis. So every single role matters. Mm -hmm. And the best thing that we can do at this time is not to try to do everything. It is not to, you know, fill ourselves up so much trying to like volunteer here and start this career and look after my children and do X, Y, and Z and go to this meditation retreat. It is to pause. It is to stop and to slow down and to look within and go, what is it that is mine to do at this time? Mm -hmm. And if you're not sure what is yours, it is a thing that brings you joy. Sometimes it's also the thing that breaks your heart. I'll be very honest. It is also the thing that causes you pain, Mm -hmm. but it is the thing that speaks to you and goes, yes, this, this matters. And there's a, there's a quote by Bayo Akomalafe, who's a Nigerian writer that I, that I love. And he says, these times are urgent, we must slow down. And I think that's the essence of this work. Yeah. How do we get in touch with ourselves? How do we uncondition ourselves? How do we get free of all the beliefs of our society, of our parents, of the people around us? We need to slow down. We need to stop, listen, and ask what is ours to do right now. Yeah. Beautifully said. Thank you. If people would like to work with you or find you on the internet, where can we lead them? So I have a website, laurahartley.com. I'm also active on Instagram at laura.h.hartley and occasionally on LinkedIn, if that's your space too, at Laura Hartley. So you can find me. Uh, My school for changemakers is called Public Love Education. but I work with people one-on-one and running groups in healing burnout culture and cultural wayfinding. Yeah. Okay. I'll add all of those into the show notes so people can find you very, very quickly. And I just have one last question to wrap up our conversation. And that is if your inner voice had a billboard, what would it say to the world? I think there's two words and it's get free. You know, when we're talking about, breaking free of conditioning, we're talking about liberation, we're talking about authenticity, we're talking about the deepest spiritual parts of ourselves. So it's not about, you know, becoming good in somebody's eyes. It's not about even becoming the best versions of ourselves. It's becoming freest versions of ourselves. So get free and use get free as a mantra to guide your life Mm -hmm. to guide your decisions what is the freest most liberating decision that you could make right now and how does that feel in your body Mm -hmm. i think that would be my mantra my billboard yeah excellent thank you so much for joining me thank you so much for having me on the show whitney i love your show so thank you for having me on thank you (laughs) Thank you so much for joining me this week. If you're listening and you like what you hear, please consider subscribing and rating this podcast as it really helps get this podcast out to other people who might be interested in hearing it but don't know about it yet. And also, if you'd like to contact me or reach me, you can reach me at unconditioningpodcast at gmail.com or unconditioningpodcast on Instagram. Thank you so much. And until next time... Stay tuned in to you.